Okay, Father, I commit this time to you now, even as we look into your word, you help me to communicate your word accurately so that whatever we do, Father, we give you praise. So thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people say, Amen. Luke 16, turn to Luke 16 with me. I'm going to share a message that the Lord actually put into my spirit over a month ago. Before Easter this year, the Lord placed in my spirit four messages, which I have delivered only two. The one just before Easter, were you there when they crucified Jesus? And then death is conquered. Today is the third, this life and the next, in a couple of weeks' time, the fourth. It's all in sequence. And the Spirit of God told me that this is the message that is very appropriate for this season in our church and for those who are listening to the podcast as well. In Luke 16, verse 19, Jesus says, this is Jesus' words, all in red. Huh? There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell. Where he was in torment, the rich man looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all of this, between us and you, a great chasm or gulf has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let, them, let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, 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 Father, Abraham, no, he said. If someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Verse 31 is very key, but Abraham said, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Three key issues surface from this parable that Jesus said. Scholars through all the ages and commentaries have tried to grapple with the understanding of this parable. And these three problematic issues are this, and I will deal with them one by one. The first problematic issue is what I call fictional character versus true people. Second problematic issue is rich man versus poor man. And the third problematic issue is this life versus the next life. Let me deal with the first one very quickly. This is the first time in the parables that Jesus told that names are mentioned. Usually when Jesus shared the parables with the disciples, he would say, once upon a time there was a farmer who sowed the seed. There's a merchant, or there is a bird, or something like that. No names. But here, the first and only time Jesus says, Lazarus. Meaning, probably the audience knew who Lazarus was. 
there was probably a real person called Lazarus. Older versions, not in this Bible, but tradition, put the name of the rich man as Nineveh, the same name given to the city of Nineveh where judgment came. So names are mentioned. Probably true life people whom the audience could identify with. We leave it like that. The second issue is more problematic. Rich man versus poor man. A superficial reading of the parable seems to suggest that rich people go to hell, poor people go to heaven. True or not? Not true. A more superficial reading would say that if you don't help the poor, you go to hell. You want to go to heaven, help the poor. Again, wrong. Why? Because richness, wealth is relative. How rich is rich? How poor is poor? Do you know that compared to the people in Africa and a lot of the people in India, all of you are very rich. And those of you who, who are rich, you know there are people richer than you? So, how rich is rich? Where is your standard? Cannot be. Because richness and wealth is relative compared to who? So what is Jesus trying to tell us? Clearly, it's never about the absolute worth of a person, how much you are worth, but rather, as far as wealth is concerned, it is not wealth per se that will prove a stumbling block to our faith in God. Why? Because, actually, if you examine the Bible, God has got no problem with wealthy people. Why? Because just offhand, I listed down a list of many people in the Bible who are very, very godly, who are also wealthy, and God was very, very happy with them. For example, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were very wealthy. It's all in the Bible. They earned so much flocks, so much properties and land, and do you know that Abraham had 256 servants? Not employees, huh? We have got one servant, two servants, three servants, wow, plenty of mates. But you got 256 servants, not employees. Sir. How many of you got 256 servants in your house? And it is true. Very clear. Abraham was wealthy. Isaac was wealthy. They have lots of herds. So God has got no problem with wealthy people. Who else? Joseph. The second in command to the Pharaoh, was a very influential and a wealthy man. Did God have a problem with that? No. Job, very wealthy. So much so, when, when, when all his wealth was removed, it is written, a lot of all this collapse, his empire collapsed, but God gave it back to him. He was very wealthy. So was David and Solomon, the wealthiest man that ever lived. No. You know the apostle Peter and Andrew, James and John actually were very wealthy fishermen. They were actually owners of a thriving fishing business. Why? Because when, when, when everything left and done, they went back to the fishing boats. In a Mark account, when Andrew and Peter left, they said they left their hired men. Zacchaeus was wealthy. And Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man because only wealthy men had tombs reserved for themselves. And he gave his tomb to Jesus. Did Jesus have any problem with wealthy people? No. So I want to say this to you. If you are wealthy, please be comforted. So what was Jesus trying to teach us? Two 
things about our wealth. Not your absolute wealth. Two very key fundamental lessons in the whole of Luke 16, which actually contains two parables. The two key lessons is this. It's not so much whether you're rich or whether you're poor, because it's relative, is that what are you doing with your wealth? While how you manage your wealth is very important, and how you view those less wealthy than you are also important, especially the poor. So if you look at Luke 16, actually there are two parables that Jesus was saying back to back. The first parable in Luke 16 verse 1, Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man. And then he spoke of the parable of the prudent or the wise manager on how to manage his wealth. And then after finishing the first parable, he goes to the second parable in verse 19, beginning with the same beginning, there was a rich man. So back to back, in Luke 16, Jesus teaches two things about wealth. In both the parables, and I don't have time to go to the first one, I will delve on the second parable. Both of these, both of them had reversals or misfortunes. The first parable, the rich man or the prudent steward or the prudent manager was dismissed, was sacked. The second parable, the rich man was demised, he died. Both had, had misfortunes. And the lesson of the first parable is managing your wealth. It is okay to be wealthy. God bless you. And it is God's desire to bless us. Promotions, la, as Pastor Stanley mentioned, la, whatever it is, don't run shy of that. God wants you to do well. God wants to bless you with riches. It is God's blessing to you. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, 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 be, don't be embarrassed about that. But key thing is, how do you manage it? And the lesson in the first parable is, Use your wealth to win friends. That's what he said. Luke 16, verse 9. Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, and none of us can take one cent with us, you will be welcome into eternal dwellings. Manage your wealth wisely, like the wise manager. But let me focus on the second parable. When Jesus says, if you are wealthy, don't look down on the poor. Don't despise those who are less wealthy than you. Very, very interesting. That's why it makes sense now, if you look at verse 13 of Luke 16, when Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. Why do we read this together? Shall we read it together? Let's read it together. Shall we? It makes sense now, all right? If you put the two parables together, now listen to me, uh, Jesus is speaking. Uh, what I'm trying to do is try to unpackage it for you, all right, and try to unpackage something for you so that you know what the Lord wants us to do, all right? So why do we read together? Luke 16, verse 13. Are you ready? One, two, three. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. So who is your master? Who masters you? And that's the whole premise of the Lord's teaching. 
nothing wrong with being blessed and God wants you to be blessed. But what masters you? In other words, wealth is a means, not your master. Use it wisely. Wealth is a tool, not your tauke. Not tauke, uh, tauke means your boss. Let me focus on the second parable. Because the second parable contains the third problematic issue. The first problematic issue, fictional character versus true. Second problematic issue, we leave it like that, richness versus poverty. The key is, manage your wealth well. But the third parable is very, very problematic because in the third character, sto uh, second story, second parable, Jesus said, the rich man went to hell. The poor man, Lazarus, went to heaven. Whoa, how, come it, how can it be? Because I said, it is not an issue whether you're wealthy or poor. Why did the rich man go to hell? Not because he was rich, not because he didn't, couldn't, couldn't care about the poor man, but because he was godless. The rich man was insolent, in other words, proud, indulgent, indifferent, and live independent of God. Whereas the poor man, his name called Lazarus, in Hebrew is called El Azar, which means the one whom God helped. God helped him. He was conscious of God. And because of this, if you live independently of God, then God says in the next life, you don't need me, ma. So you don't need me la, forever. La. So here we find that a rich man landed up in hell. At this juncture, I can almost hear some of you, your emotions rising. Why does a loving God send people to hell? You know how many people have asked me this question? Cannot be, pastor, cannot be. How can there be hell? I don't know the answer. Ask Jesus. If Jesus says there is hell, there is heaven, then if it must be hell, it must be heaven, right? He knows better, ma. he has been there. Ma. So you can argue with me till kingdom come. I don't have the answer. I, you, you, you win, you win. You win, you, you win. You go and win. Actually, a more appropriate question, which my wife corrected me today, he said you should tell the people, it's not so much why a loving God sends people to hell, because God doesn't do that. How come a loving God come down to rescue people from hell? That's more appropriate. Because all of us are heading that way. But God in His love came to rescue you from hell. To change your destiny. Not to send you there pluck you out from there. That's more appropriate. And she also corrected me. So don't argue with me. Eh? No problem. More important in here. You decide lah, huh? what is right, what is not right. So what happened is that this rich man, as he died, probably at the funeral, ba -ba 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 -ba, there was much pass. Boom! 21 gun salute. Flowers everywhere. Turned the whole place into a, in almost like a garden, you know. The best coffin. 
eulogies after eulogies by, by the son and the daughters that say how good the dad or the mother is after they fight like mad for the inheritance. You know, I don't understand why people say good things to people only when they die. You know? Why don't they say when you're alive? You know? He's dead. So, elaborate sending off. The poor man just died. But you know something? He had a wonderful welcome behind his head. See, the key is this. It is not so much how elaborate your farewell is on this side that matters. More important, what kind of a welcome you receive on the other side that matters more. Hear me right. It is not the farewell from this life that matters. It is the welcome on the other side that matters more. And this, is the premise of the second parable. It reminds me of Stephen, the martyr, when he was stoned to death for his faith. In Acts chapter 7, we read that even as, Martha, uh, as Stephen was martyred and was about to die, he, he looked up and he said, Look! Stephen the martyr said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus usually sit one no. But here Jesus stand up. Welcome, Stephen. What kind of a welcome will you and I have on the other side? It is not the exit. It is the entry. Believe me, my friend, really believe me. The Lord spoke to me way before Easter. Share this with the church. Do you know what kind of welcome the 21 Coptic Christians will have in heaven? Do you know what kind of welcome the 30 Ethiopian Christians will have in heaven? not the exit. It is the entry. So there are several things I learned about heaven and hell from Jesus. First of all, three things. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Do you know that just about a month ago, there was an Indonesian evangelist by the name of Philip Mentofa. He came and he gave a very, very um, inspiring and whatever it is meeting at Putra Stadium, organized by FGA. And he entitled it A Trip to Hell. Why? Because in January 2000, the Lord took him to hell, and I got a copy of his testimony. I won't read to you what he, what he described, but it's grotesque. It's biblical. He described stories of what he saw. And, and several things he mentioned here, I, I, I don't even want to read to you. Uh. But believe me, you know who Philip's guy is? This is the guy whose church had 40 over members of his church who perished at the Air Asia crash recently. 40 members or more of his church died when the Air Asia crashed. But all of them, he knows, are in heaven, you see. So God showed him a vision or whatever it is and he could describe to you, to the people there in such Clary graphic terms all written here. And I, I don't read it to you, but believe me. And so when he gave the altar call that night in Putra Stadium, 3,000 people came forward. It's the biggest answer to altar call in the Malaysian history. And out of that 3,000, 1,250 were first-time conversions. 
Whoa! And I, and I saw and I saw the video of, of the actual altar call. People run forward. Uh, they run. Uh, because hell is real. I was speaking to one of the elders of FGA yesterday morning. And he was telling me that out of the 1,000 over people that accepted Jesus, already 200 have been baptized. Come on, let's give God a clap offering. The point is this. Hell is real. Heaven is also real. Praise God for that. Heaven is also real. And there is hope. Amen. Come on, let's go clap offering. There is hope, friend. There is hope. That's why they all run forward for what? Huh? There is hope. Jesus came to rescue us from hell so that we can go to heaven. You think, Pastor, this is fictional. Remember, is it fictional or is it true? You decide me. I'm telling you a story. Is Jesus trying to tell you a story? Or is he opening your eyes so that we put our feet on the ground and don't think that we live this life and that's the end? It is not the end. The second thing. I'm just telling you the facts, uh, what Jesus says, without adding pepper, salt, everything in. Uh, I may dramatize it a bit, uh, forgive me for that. Uh. But the second fact I hear is what I, 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 I take my ZLs on, on what I called uh, roots and wings. I said, discovery question, discovery. Look at the passage. Tell me what you say. Don't add in it. Just write it down. So the second thing I read, discovery question is, hell is hot. Why? Because the rich man turned to Father Abraham and he said in verse uh, somewhere, in verse uh, 24, Father Abraham, have pity on me, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water, cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. So there's fire. How clear can you get? There's fire. It's hot. You see? And he's in torment. In fact, Philip and Tofa says, mate, you can feel there or no? You can think. You can sense. You can talk. You can remember. In other words, you're not totally annihilated and without a vegetable. You can sense. In fact, Philip and Tofa says, in hell, your senses are sharper. If you're scared, you'll be scarier still. If you feel pain, you feel more pain. That's what he say, lah. Huh? But the fact remains, you know, you are conscious. So hell is hot. Heaven, eh? I don't know whether it's cool or not. Eh? Never say. I don't know whether it's like Gunting or Cameron's. So how do you describe heaven? Heavenly, law. <laughs> I don't know. So again, discovery question. You don't look into things that are not there, right? So if I were to lead a, a, a group, how is heaven? Uh? Pastor is cool. Where, where, where? Show me where. It's not there. So we don't say it's not there. But we know that hell is hot. But the third fact is very interesting. Abraham said, Verse 26, besides all this between us and you, there's a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Look, these are things that Jesus is trying to tell you. There is an inseparable gulf. You cannot cross over. There is no purgatory. In other words, eternal destiny, once fixed at death, cannot be changed. There is a finality to it. And therefore, it is very important what we do 
while we still have the time. Because life is unpredictable. I used to enjoy flying, but now I don't. I just want to reach my destination and that's it. I love to sit last time in the day, eat all my nasi lemak, but now <laughs> just make me arrive safely. You know, we don't know. Just in case some of you think, oh, I'm so young, I'm only 20 years old. It's only for the oldies. Lah. Not true. On the 15th of December, 2014, last year, Tony Johnson, Katrina Dawson went to work in downtown Sydney. On normal days work, Tony Johnson was the manager of Lynn Chocolate Cafe in downtown Sydney. Katharina Dawson was a successful lawyer that had a practice just down the road. Both of them never arrived home that day. But you say, Pastor, that's, it doesn't happen in Malaysia. It doesn't happen to me. I don't know. Just last week or two weeks ago, one of the daughters of my cell leader, Chelsea, 13 years old, just died suddenly on the dinner table. And at the funeral, the classmates and the schoolmates were all there. Why? Don't know. So my point is this, my friend. Don't sleep. I got so much time left. We don't know. Let me close by referring you to Luke 16, verse 27 to verse 31. I beg you, Father. Send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, father, no. If someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then father Abraham said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. What was Jesus saying? In other words, if you don't want to take what I have shared with you this morning as the truth, it's your prerogative. And even if someone rises from the dead, that may not be enough to convince you. That's what this Lazarus said. That's what the rich man said. Send Lazarus! But you know what Jesus says? They got Pastor Chu. They have all these people. In other words, when he said they got a prophets and the Moses, they have the word. You have the word. If you don't listen and think it's all fiction, well, maybe nothing will convince you, even if somebody rises from the dead. And I do not think it's fortuitous or coincidental that this man is called Lazarus. Why? Because in John 11, another Lazarus was raised from the dead. Do you know that? Lazarus, come forth! And Lazarus came out. Do you know that at the end of that passage, it's written, some believed. But a lot others did not believe. 
in effect, they even plotted to kill Jesus. It's true. Even if Lazarus was raised from the dead. And you don't want to believe, you will not believe. They have the prophets. They have Moses. Let them listen to them. So I want to share this with you from my heart. I told you way back a month ago, the Lord said, Son, Wing Chi, I want you to share this with SIPKL. You decide. I want to believe that this day, Many of you who have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't toll up anywhere yet. Honestly. God is giving you an opportunity to make a decision that will affect you eternally. Because you don't know. Really, you don't know. So I'm going to make three altar calls today for three categories of people. Number one, for those of you who have yet received Jesus, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to call it come forward after the song. Seminary. So those of you who have yet to receive Jesus Christ, even for the God balcony, you can either walk out that way or you can walk down. Very simple, right? Up to you. But I want to believe that God has given you an opportunity to make an eternal decision you know, at the second service, first this morning, there was a young man that came out, still arguing with me. Came out, arguing. I say, son, don't argue with me. You want to argue, you argue. Lah. I'm just telling you what God says. In love, I shared with him once again the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that at the end of the day, he broke down. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. You don't argue with me. You just come to God, no matter how young, how old you are. Because Jesus knows what he's talking about. Even if I don't know. The second altar call I want to make is for those of you who want to rededicate your life afresh to God again. It's not about your wealth, how much you have or how much you don't have. It's about living your life for God. Do you know that I sense in my spirit that the messages that are being preached from this pulpit is more and more intense because the times are don't just go through life as if nothing is happening. I'm not asking you to go full time. Huh? I'm just asking you to live for God. Is that difficult? So the second altar call is for those of you who want to rededicate your life again to God. Don't care who you are. But something in your spirit tells you from this day I will live for God. I will use my connections. I will use my resources. I will use whatever it is God has placed upon me, my friends. And I want to live for God. And it takes faith to do that. You come. And the third category of people, I want to pray for the sick. It's not yet your time. And my prayer for you is God will heal you so that you are strong, you are healthy, and then you will use the rest of your remaining years on planet Earth, no matter how young, how old you are, with a strong, healthy body, to love God and to serve Him. So the third category of people is for those who are sick. We want to pray for you, because we believe that God will heal you. Amen? Just stand there. Just stand with me. Just stand with me. I don't want anyone to come out yet. If you don't have to leave, don't leave. It's a very reverential period. In my spirit, I know that this is a time when you make your choices. 
you don't do anything yet. You just stay and allow the Spirit of God to minister to your spirit man. Whatever I have done, I've just expounded the Word of God to the best I know how. Just allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. Will you do that? You decide, my friend, that you give your life to Jesus, you will never be shortchanged. You decide to go to another level. God has been speaking to you for many, many years. And you've been wanting to do that. But every time you leave this place, it's gone. But today I want you to commit. Today I want you to make a choice. And you say, God, you have spoken. And I will submit and I will obey. By doing that, I know that God will guide you and lead you to greater heights. You don't have to fear, my friend. You don't have to be afraid. What happens or what? No. Remember, it is the Father God. The Father heart of God that will guide you, that will lead you, that will guard you, that will also bless you. But it demands faith to rise to another level. And you want to say, God, I am available. In whatever way it is, you come. And of course, those of you who are sick, you just come as well. So we're going to sing this hymn and the altar is now open. And you respond to the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Those of you who have yet to receive Jesus Christ, you just go to my left. Those of you who want prayer for healing and for whatever it is, you come to the center. Those of you who want to re rededicate your life to Jesus, you do that one way or another. You just trust God. Understand? You trust, trust God. Amen. Hallelujah. You can see the balcony. You just come, my friend. You just come. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the power of Christ. No fear. No fear in life. Ain't no fear at all. Amen. Whoa. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of Come down as well. Amen. Hallelujah. Whoa. Before we sing the last verse again, I just want to say this to you. If God is speaking to your spirit, man, you don't toll up. You don't resist. Because you may not have that prompting again in your spirit. It's not emotional. But you can't say it's not emotional, right? Because emotions are involved. You cannot love somebody and say, I'm not, I don't feel it. To some degree, emotions are involved, but that is not the only thing. More important is your will. I decide based on knowledge, based on instruction, based on what I know, not only in my head, but in my spirit. Something tells me, Pastor, what you're saying is true. And you walk away from this place. Turn away from it. Man, don't do that. 
hear the voice of the Lord, respond to Him. In one way or another, God is speaking to you, you respond to Him. And God will guide you one step at a time. You'll be saved. One thing the Lord spoke to me, even in the last couple of weeks, both Pastor Lee Chu and myself, I will not shame you. I will not humiliate you. I will not malu you. All you need to do is to obey. That's what I'm doing now. I'm obeying only ma. That's what you need to do. Just submit. Take the step of faith, whatever it is, and you trust God. 